thank you for coming well, and <laughs> yeah thank you for uh, for having me over that's uh, thank you ivana uh, eliska and uh, peter and petra and transit <laughs> so that's um, i'm very happy to be here it's my second time also in bratislava um so it's uh, exciting that's um and um, yeah, then to start, I, I'm used to somehow to stand when I. <laughs> is it okay? Or do you want me to sit? Is a, it's a, it's any any anything? Okay, then I keep it like this, and I think I can. I, oh yeah, thank you. That's perfect. Yeah. Um, yeah, somehow the the. Uh, the Tear Garden research, you know, in a way, is really uh, defining also for. Uh, um, I must say also for the research within our office, because with Sylvan, we did also later on a larger project, which is about trying to sort of define, um, even though it is fragmentary, but an environmental history of architecture. And that was, uh, and Tiergarten somehow became pivotal, a, a, an important moment. Um, but I start, I hope you can see uh, the images. Um, it's beautiful sun and reflection here. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Um, this is, I, I'm going to tell you so about this project which started in um, 2013 and it, it was, uh, I did this research at the Technical University in, uh, um, in Berlin and I did two seminars with students and they were field, um, it was field research and I invited many experts that knew about tear garden from many many different perspectives so they came from the ecology side the heritage side and uh, or ornithology or entomology so study of insects and so on so it was really interesting and with the students sort of try to navigate this place which is kind of mysterious in in berlin at least for me it, it was always kind of mysterious and dense and strange very different from many other parts in uh, other uh, cities in, in europe um, somehow, um, because of its mystery, uh, slowly led us to very interesting discoveries. And uh, um, maybe I start then with a question that is kind of came out from the research about Tiergarten. Um, and the question is, when does a human constructed place go beyond the human? And how necessary is this transgression? Um, Starting so to the work on, on Tiergarten, it was a way to look at the city from the point of view of uh, natural history and to look at the built environment from this perspective so that you, one is kind of allowed or encouraged to explore the city as a construct of the human and nature together. On a second um, view, then introduces the, the a notion of the city as a construct that uh, is uh, making resources, a system that is making resources. I can maybe explore that a little bit, a little bit better. Instead of a machine of consumption, we are used to understand the city as a machine of consumption that is uh, practically uh, depending on the countryside, of course, for for uh, uh, its wealth and its uh, uh, livelihood, in a way. Um, so this kind of emergence, uh, merging of two realms, the natural and the, the human together in a constructed place was kind of important. And uh, um, um, then if we maybe, I don't know, if you take the, the, the notion of the Anthropocene, or maybe, you know, it's a critical notion, obviously. Uh, but if you understand the Anthropocene as the epoch of uh, uh, ecological collapse and uh, mass extinction, once you try to sort of go beyond this uh, dualism between uh, the natural and the human, then you are encouraged to explore models that support uh, the human and the natural in an equal way. And... Uh, um, and also that understand the natural and the human as mutually dependent. So this is a little bit of the framework to look at Tiergarten. And Tiergarten became then one of, of many models, but at least for me was, was the beginning. Um, so we see here a picture of uh, its wild state. And uh, uh, Tiergarten is uh, Berlin's oldest park. It's 210 hectares. 
um, of forest. And uh, what's interesting about it, 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 it uh, um, there are, everything is somehow happens in it, in a way. So aspects of ecology, or uh, uh, heritage, of politics, of daily life, uh, of um, uh, urbanism, um, are, are all present in this place, while they're also visibly transgressed. So in a way, um, Tirgantic is an island of anomalies, and, uh, uh, and this, this uh, kind of state of tear garden as, a, as an anomaly becomes also, can be read or as a radical expression of what is urban. So it is somehow a promise of what the city could be. So it's a city of, an imagined city, perhaps a city, hopefully, the city of the future. And uh, um, so it's not only the place where the human and the, non, the more than human uh, coexist, <laughs> But it's also where human history and natural history are, are constructed together. So that's uh, a bit the, also the, another more specific framework about about the place. Um, I'm going to go through different stages of of this place just to uh, show you a bit the history. Also, because I want to show you that it is an original forest from the beginning on, and it was there before the city uh, was constructed was built. Um, we see here, maybe you, you recognize the, um, the, Große, uh, the, the big star, the Große Stern, and here you have the victory um, column, uh, the golden victory in, in the middle. Here you have Brandenburger Tor, and so this is a bit the beginning of this place. It's the first map we have of this place, and it's um, basically a fence defining this forest or en enclosing this forest um, at the doors of the, uh, of the origins of, of Berlin. There was the, the castle was there, so the, the king would go there hunting, as it was a hunting ground. Uh, as many parts in, in Europe were built, with, or they were born in this way. And the first thing you see, it's a dense forest, all these dots signify uh, trees, um, and the first action, the first um, practically design uh, was to uh, carve out, carve out the, the roads to, to make sort of the connection between, in this case, Charlottenburg, which was a residence of the queen, or the, uh, yeah, there was a prince elector, I mean, they're called differently in German, but anyway, queen and, and the king on, on that side. So the king could cross over this, uh, this place. And, and Tiergarten is laid along the spray which is the ancient glacial valley, the deepest uh, section of the glacial valley in, in Berlin, which means that this area was continually flooded. So it's a floodplain, it's a marsh forest, it's a, it's a swampish forest. And we keep going, then we move to the, from the 15th century, the map was, uh, before we saw from the, was from the 15th century, we move on to the, um, 18th century, so it's a Baroque time, and in this case, the fence is, is, uh, disa has disappeared, and Tiergarten became uh, a public forest, a public park, but it's still, certainly the characteristic is still a forest, it's still dense, and the, the, the work of the landscape architect um, Knobelstorff, that was his name, was to practically to carve out further elements, so, so rooms and salons and space, uh, spaces or, or trails and the pathways in the in Baroque uh, fashion. So they're very geometric and kind of beautiful. So, but it's always the, the action of taking out uh, the natural or the forest and, and establishing then uh, spatial uh, elements within it. And we move on, this is another moment, this is already the early 19th century, and practically it's pretty much still the same way, Tiergarten is based on the work of uh, um, uh, Peter Joseph Lenné, very important landscape architect. And he kept working on it, like this taking out, so sort of extracting the forest to create a different qualities of, of spaces. In this case, he drained also the water, so he has waterways going from the Landwehr Canal uh, here, and that can move slowly towards the spray, so that it's not anymore a swampish forest, it doesn't flood anymore. And what he does also uh, in the English um, fashion, uh, so English garden fashion, uh, which is um, uh, sort of to, and, um, and to sort of 
simulate nature or natural landscape, beautiful landscape, picturesque landscape, of course it's like a painting, uh, was also to extract the forest in, and uh, establish more uh, clearings and uh, so that you would have more place where you can uh, linger and, and, uh, and enjoy this place. So, but that's uh, just to give you like a the framework of how it changed throughout the years. And uh, this is a um, very beautiful painting from the late uh, 19th century uh, from, uh, no, it's uh, actually, 18th century, it's more 18th century, late 18th century. Uh, uh, Daniel uh, Chodowieski, a uh, Polish painter. And the, uh, um, what I like about it is really how the people in their beautiful clothes, uh, they just linger and they just sit on the ground or they sit along uh, the, the, the waterways and they uh, um, sort of this, this uh, sensual way of enjoying the place and it's very free there is no real uh, determination in the, in the space there is no real design it's really they're just uh, enjoying this kind of natural uh, sort of or pseudo natural forest uh, uh, I, I like to show it also because of um, Alexander von Humboldt, because he is a, he, when, he was a, when he was a student, he was 19 years old, he would go through the forest and collect mosses and, and lichens. And then uh, um, he felt this kind of, he writes these beautiful letters about Tiergarten to his friends, and he writes about uh, uh, the, uh, the harmony he would feel with the, with the natural, natural state somehow. So in a way, this, this, this uh, painting for me stands for that emotion, yeah. And uh, very different from uh, early uh, 20th century, it's 1904. Uh, this picture was taken, taken in that time. This is the military craze, uh, Prussian craze of uh, distributing military also statues and uh, self um, you call this an, um, uh, glorifying also uh, sculptures and, and monuments everywhere in the city, especially in Tiergarten. And you see how stiff the people has, have to stand in front of this uh, kind of uh, uh, artifacts. <laughs> so it just as a contrast. This is very pivotal moment also for, for a tear garden because it's a moment of the destruction and it wasn't really Second World War that destroyed tear garden. Uh, they, they were the, the, the very bad or very cold winters of 1946 and 1947 when people had to survive in a destroyed city, the citizens, and they didn't have uh, uh, anything to burn to keep warm. So the um, uh, British Army gave uh, permission to uh, cut 200,000 trees in, in Tiergarten, practically the entire park was, was cut down, was uh, felled, and, uh, and only out of these 200,000, only 700 old trees survived, and up to now, there are only 100 ancient trees that are really over 500 years old that you can still find in Tiergarten. So it's practically like a, a moment uh, of zero history for, for uh, a starting, starting anew for, for this place, uh, kind of really dramatic moment, obviously. Um, then the next step, uh, immediately after the war, also many of the um, surfaces or the, uh, the, the places in, in, Tier, in Tiergarten or uh, the areas in Tiergarten were given also for um, allotment gardens for people, also for self-sustenance, but it was always a very dramatic situation. People were sleeping in the garden in order to protect the, the produce, so it, wasn't, it, wasn't, it was far from an idea of urban gardening in this case. Uh, here, of course, near the uh, Brandenburger Tor. And there are two moments that define Tiergarten as it is now. So um, first, it's a new plan of the replantation. And uh, the second aspect that defines Tiergarten as we know it now is uh, the Berlin Wall. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the replantation in the way it was conceived. Um, he was uh, uh, um, a director, a garden director was appointed almost immediately after the war, so in the early 50s, 1950s. Willi Alverdes, that's his name, and uh, um, he, um, there were many different proposals, but anyway, he practically was a proposal that sort of found 
more support. Um, he sort of looks at uh, the Lenné garden, a uh, Lenné uh, plant, the last one we saw, and, uh, and practically reused that plant, but there are many different, there are many changes in, in this case. And it's uh, based on uh, horticultural decisions, the way he planted the, the trees and the vegetation. Um, he decided to uh, introduce a new um, scientific studies about plant societies, plant communities, and the way plants uh, really shape communities that are sustainable and they last long. You know, usually plants you know, in a landscape that is always successional change in a, in a landscape, so it's always a mo moment from rock to pioneer plants to, I don't know, field, grass fields, and eventually forest. But the plants somehow hold together, in a way, from the layer of the grass, to the bush, to the tree. And he used uh, these new studies uh, to implement it in Tiergarten. And he used six different plant societies that are specific for the Brandenburg region. And um, a few of them were a bit uh, more foreign, but he wanted to introduce more variety, spatial variety, through the plants themselves. What he also did was to not reconstruct the, the, uh, the many of the axes. There are many more now that have been reconstructed, especially after the reunification uh, um, of Germany. Uh, but here you, you see there are many, many of these um, Baroque axes were missing, and the clearings are much more uh, expanded. And uh, also the clearings were supposed to be um, used by citizens, what wasn't the case for Lenné. Um, it, they were not supposed to use. Anyway, but th this is mostly about the, the plants, the plant societies. There was this, uh, just to show you another plan, uh, more specific, uh, of what uh, Billy Alverdes did. Uh, he, he was somehow also informed by the reform movements of the early 20th century. He was also, I don't know, um, he, he had this idea that this park should not only serve humans, uh, it should be also there for animals and wild animals and also wild plants. Um, there should be the possibility to allow for different variety of spaces so that different organisms could, uh, could live and can linger here. And this is just one example. It's the rhododendron grove. Um, it's a, um, he, he drew or he, made, he drew this plan and specifically he shows, we, are, we can see here uh, a main path, so it's a, it's a large trail for uh, many people to go over. Then you have a smaller one here along the water, um, also for more, a little bit less people, but then you have a very t tiny trail going through this very dense uh, kind of uh, grove. And in this case, it's like really like 50 centimeters wide and only one person can go through it, and not even two people near each other. So he really wanted to have different degrees uh, negotiating different uh, um, intimacies within, uh, within the garden. So that was a bit his idea. And plus you also have these niches and all these kind of things, little places where uh, um, people can hide, but also animals and also new plants can, can grow here undisturbed. So um, the level of control is going to be uh, less in this place, also less control of uh, less transparency. And it's kind of interesting that it's already set up in, the, in this way by Villel Verdes. What he, uh, he had, um, the, the Tiergarten, um, uh, there was an immediate plan to replant it, also because uh, uh, the, the city had many um, sort of uh, uh, sun, sand uh, storms or uh, um, there was a dust storms so that were really because of the rubble within the city but also because Kiritir Garten is so big, such a large area, there was a, practically a desert. Uh, so it was a um, ecological problem but also um, from the point of view of the morale, the people were really felt um, devastated that Tier Garten was destroyed, was gone. So there was two things that really pushed for the replantation that started immediately. And there were many donations, many different trees came also from different cities uh, and everywhere was sent also from also different countries sent over uh, specific plants. Um, and the, uh, so he also implemented a pragmatic way of replantation, uh, which reflects also forestry um, management. 
So you have a, a layer of slow growing plants like uh, oaks and uh, beeches that are also kind of uh, delicate and need the moisture and need protection. And uh, between these slow growing trees, he planted fast growing trees, so pioneer trees like uh, beeches and poplars and so on. They could grow fast and, and establish a good ground for, for the rest. And the long term plan was to uh, fell the, the fast growing trees uh, after 30 years, so about in the maybe late 70s and the early 80s, this was going to, to happen. Um, but yeah, this is just um, um, this was the plan that, that got interrupted though after 30 years, and I'm going to tell you why. This is the, where the the wall, the Berlin Wall, played a role into that slowing down or interruption of the felling of the fast growing trees. So that Tiergarten became a denser forest. But here we see this is the a picture. More or less, it's, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> it's taken. It's taken near um, the rhododendron uh, grove, and you can see sort of the variety and the richness, sort of, and the, the density of this uh, this place. It's really constructed. You can see it's. Uh, it looks. It's an imitation, a simulation of the natural. But at the same time, uh, um, it is obviously constructed. Um, but uh, you see the richness of the, the construction. The, the, the plant societies actually they establish a specific quality of, of places, the plants themselves. So that was uh, the, the perhaps one of the most special things about Tiergarten. And yeah, I come. This is one of the oldest trees that are still there. It's an ancient uh, oak, it's still there, even though yeah, they're doing some. Uh, 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 tree um, surgery and <laughs> it's not really that, that kind but anyway it's still there um, but I, what I, with this tree I, I want to show you that uh, this uh, the long-term plan of uh, felling the trees was uh, um, slowed down through a, a, a specific political also movement and uh, which is the environmental movement in Germany and, but specifically also in West Berlin, and because of the wall, uh, West Berlin had a very specific perspective uh, towards its open areas, its open uh, places, its green areas, but also every kind of open areas, also the, the rubble area, the destroyed areas, the fallow land. Um, so there was this, uh, obviously, an introverted, uh, glance and uh, view towards the city because people couldn't really leave the city. Here we see, of course, uh, it's a, you see a, a clear boundary of West Berlin. Tiergarten, in this case, is here, right at the edge uh, towards uh, East Berlin. And, uh, and what we see here in this map is a, also a specific doc document that happened for the first time in West Berlin. And it is uh, the first biotope map uh, that there is of a city. Um, it was done, uh, the work started already in the 60s, so at the early onset, as, well, when, when the wall was built. And uh, the, the map, together with, um, well, with a research book and a guideline, a book of guidelines, was published in 1984. But the, the, the work then started in the 60s and it continued throughout uh, all these years. And uh, which pushed the, um, uh, there was a decision by the House of Representatives then in, in the mid-70s to stop the felling of, of the trees in Tiergarten with the idea that you can reestablish somehow a virgin forest, a rainforest. Uh, um, yeah, in, in this. So this is a little bit of the political climate that uh, changed Tiergarten again in, in, in sort of in an interesting way because this is the way we still perceive this place and it's, it, it had an effect also in the way it's, it's been used so far. Um, but I wanted to talk about the biotope map because it's a very interesting uh, document. Uh, what we can see, uh, yeah, just the, the, the moment, the, the psychological moment is really the, of introversion, of really looking at the city, at all open areas as anomalies. they are precious anomalies that need to be protected, whatever they are. Even though they're not, uh, they're, they're spontaneous. It's spontaneous vegetation growing on rubble. That was uh, that was a bit the idea, 
And uh, this uh, sudden introversion of looking at the city as a natural realm was uh, very important and, and, uh, and the first radical, um, I say, um, um, approach that, that, uh, that understood the city in this way, as a, as a realm of the natural and the human together. And I'm showing you different images uh, that what the city of Berlin looked like back then. This is not Berlin, obviously this is uh, London, but it was similar because there was also parallelly to, to Berlin and this new understanding of the city as a, as a wilderness. It was also happening in London and there is a beautiful book by uh, Richard Fitter, it's called London's Natural History. It didn't turn out into a biotope map, but it, it, it's certainly a, a very defining moment, this book. And this is an image uh, strictly from, from Berlin. So we see uh, a destroyed lot and uh, a destroyed building and uh, after a few years, um, very interesting plants started to grow in, to grow in the city. And this is because uh, um, the plant seeds, uh, they can survive below the ground, especially when you build a city, you know, they get dug in into the foundations and they can survive for centuries. And when the bombs arrived, they sort of acted as, as uh, time machines because they brought all these uh, seeds to the surface, seeds that, or plants that were not seen in the countryside for many, a long time or even not even, mm, not to mention the city, and they started growing within the city. So they started to draw the attention of the botanists, uh, the citizens, uh, people are in, have an interest in, um, in, in plants, in animals, and uh, so everybody started to be really aware of this new strange nature growing within the city. They described it almost like an exotic nature, and, and what, uh, this is again from the book by Richard Fitcher in London's Natural History, but this is a connection there. And this uh, drew the attention, obviously, of scientists, uh, botanists, uh, to mention one is Herbert Sukop, who is uh, the founder of urban ecology in Berlin, uh, the TU Berlin, is a botanist, and he started to really look at the city. There was a moment when botanists couldn't go outside, so the city became uh, the topic of interest, and, and in this case, it was an exciting moment because it was a way to redefine the city, also in long term. So it wasn't just the documentation; it was also uh, there was an urge of planning, re reconsidering, or planning the city in a very different way. Um, Herbert Sukop was uh, um, uh, the advisor of a very important um, foundation work for the. Um, uh, for the biotope map, which is a work by uh, Wolfram Kunig. Wolfram Kunig, who is a, a, a landscape planner, and he uh, did his PhD based on this study of uh, in West Berlin on the base of the plants that were growing in the city. And it was a vast research, and he had to, of course, he, he considered the entire part of West Berlin. And what he took also is an instrument from uh, architecture and urban planning. He, it's the first time that he took a, a ground figure plan of the city in the scale one to 50,000. Uh, the botanists never really did that. They did the charts and they did surveys and they did lists, but they never really worked on a map. So it was uh, also an important moment because uh, then he became propositional. He became more a plan than just a documentation. So using tools from architecture. Uh, in this case, he divided the city in four different areas uh, and they're all based on the quality of the plants. And uh, everything is included, also the dense areas here where you see, still see dense building blocks. And there are specific um, elements of, of nature that can grow there, can develop there, or they also have the chance to also develop further on. Uh, I'm showing you um, Another example by Kunik, uh, he uh, was very happy to find, to, to be able to document one area that was the former um, uh, Potsdamer um, station that was destroyed during the war in Potsdamer Platz. And in this case, this area belonged to East Berlin while uh, uh, laying in, in uh, West Berlin. So it was fenced in and nobody could go inside. So this area was allowed to be, to grow, to develop, in terms of plants and nature for about 25 years. 
And just because, and, and on uh, the moment when they were about to exchange the, the, the areas, it was often this moment when they would exchange areas from east to the west, so that this would uh, um, fall in, under the jurisdiction of West Berlin. Um, he had the chance to go in and then document it. And then what's beautiful about it, it's typical, I don't know, that's a typical plan. You have different areas and different kind of uh, uh, plant society. It was also defined by main plants. Usually you have one main plant that defines this society within, uh, within the area. Um, but these are slides from that time, from Kunik, and uh, they show this uh, really strange natural landscape growing on, uh, on a human-constructed space, a human-constructed uh, environment. And these photographs, in a way, they suggest also uh, what the biotope map uh, became also as a tool, a propositional tool, a, a tool of, uh, of planning, because um, within this, uh, the biotope map wasn't just a map, it was also a series of a thick book of guidelines, 600 pages of guidelines on how to, um, how to deal with the management of, of the city, the, um, uh, the, the care management of the city, of the outdoors of the city, or also, not only of the outdoors, also of the indoors. And uh, these guidelines contain, suggest at least a, a new aesthetics and aesthetics of decay, of natural transformations that are, should be included uh, in the city, should be part of the city. So in a way, they sanctioned uh, wilderness as being um, a regular part of, of the city. And, uh, and this, yeah, this documentation obviously uh, supports or, or suggests or introduces this kind of sensibility, uh, natural processes as part of our, uh, of our urban environment. He talks about societies of mosses and so on. It's beautiful language, very scientific, but it's the, the, the suggestions uh, are kind of beautiful settlements of mosses and so on and so forth. And uh, here, just uh, to show, just a zoom in from the map, and we see here Tiergarten again. And this was the moment when uh, Tiergarten changed, uh, or was changed politically, because uh, the biotope map and the um, these guidelines, which is called the Species Protection Program, was, um, uh, uh, was practically commissioned by the Berlin Senate. And uh, so it was a, there was a political support behind all this, this plan. And Tiergarten, in this case, was, uh, uh, there was the decision exactly not to fell any more trees or to slow down very much that process, and therefore to have it even more dense in its own vegetation, its own forest-like uh, uh, mm. uh, status. Um, here, just to show you one, uh, um, just briefly about the guidelines, which are extremely radical, and they were never really fully implemented. And this is why I'm always showing this, because this is like a plan for the future, and it's never yet implemented. And it could be implemented. It could be really interesting to see what happens if we implement it at the full, all the guidelines that were suggested. In this case, I just want to talk about one small suggestion they say about uh, the building blocks, that there should be uh, not only just uh, roof gardens or vegetation the facade, obviously, yes. But they suggest that in the unheated floors, like the attic or the cellar, that uh, animals are allowed to live inside. Animals, want to, so wild animals could, could could live inside this place. So that's uh, to increment um, the proximity of the different species within the city. So it's just, um, yeah, it's it's very interesting because it's the driest uh, scientific language that they use. But the proposition is is kind of wild <laughs> and, and fascinating. Uh, okay, this is another page from uh, Richard Fitter, in a way, uh, just to, to bring in this idea of cohabitating with the different animals in this case. Okay, cockroaches and, and spiders. Um, um, uh, I'm, I'm going to break a little bit. Now, I'm going to go through a different kind of events and stories about Tiergarten. Um, and uh, um, just to give you a little bit what's fascinating about the place, or at least what I found fascinating. Um, I hope I didn't forget anything uh, in this case. 
these are like short stories. Um, and um, so this is a story of the Entlastungsstrasse. The Entlastungsstrasse is called, it's a relief road that was built uh, in West Berlin because there was this large plan of an uh, of, uh, autobahn, of a highway crossing, crossing the city. It was massive. And uh, uh, there, were, there were many citizens' initiatives that opposed uh, this kind of planning, and eventually it wasn't built anymore. But uh, this relief road was built as a fragment, and it crossed Tiergarten, so divided Tiergarten in two parts. Um, in a way, I show it because it shows a little bit the scale of, of the place. It gives you the idea of the scale of, of Tiergarten. In the background, you see uh, the towers of Potsammerplatz, but this is like, a, it's, it's, a, it's a strange moment because this is the moment when in 2006, um, the Entlastungstrasse, the relief road, was going to be uh, um, destroyed or taken away, uh, erased from, from Tiergarten. So it's a moment when it's closed, closed in, it's still there, and it's a fast, fast track road, and you see also the guardrail on the side, but it's empty, so it's a little bit like a Mad Max moment in, in Tiergarten, but it's, and also the relationship to the city is kind of obvious, but in the same time, the scale of the vegetation and the density of the vegetation is, is pretty um, uh, present in this, in this way. And it, in, in a way, it allows also the dissolution of this, uh, or the, yeah, the dissolution of, of the dualism between city and, uh, and nature, in a way. It suggests this kind of idea. Um, another event is the um, uh, Kubat Triangle, Lini Kubat Triangle. It's this piece of, of land, also which used to be part of Tiergarten, but not anymore. Now, <laughs> fortunately, and it's uh, of course adjacent to to the wall. Here we have uh, Brandenburger Tor and Reichstag on that side, and this is the the, the driest part of Tiergarten, uh, which was fascinating until 2009. And uh, after that, it wasn't fascinating anymore. Um, but this triangle, you see, it's quite really interesting in terms of the vegetation. It's kind of low vegetation, very, very dry, very interesting. Uh, this also was uh, part of East Berlin while being in West Berlin. And it became also a, a place of uh, um, agitation, of political agitation, demonstration, at the moment when this uh, area was going to be exchanged uh, uh, to uh, to the to the east, and because in the verge of this um, um, planning of the um, of the autobahn, so some some of the people, so there was this uh, plan, still planning of the autobahn, and people started uh, they occupied this place, especially the people who were protesting against the uh, the, the planning of the autobahn. And, in, uh, and uh, from 20 people who protested and, and occupied this area, they became uh, 200, who started occupying for many different political reasons, they started to take this. So it became like a, a place that was uh, free of, uh, for interpretation and a politi political protest. And what's interesting is, is the moment for the moment of the exchange, sorry for the quality of, of, of the photograph, but uh, the police started to close in to this area, and that was uh, the moment of the exchange of, of the area to, to the east, or to the, to the west, and for another one for the east. And the demonstrators, it was the first time they crossed over the wall and they went to the east, uh, practically. So it's, it's in, in, in a way, it also stands for this, uh, 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 for the free interpretation of, of the space, or perhaps for the, um, also the political will that, that uh, Tiergarten can draw and, uh, or the, the moment where the people see an urgency to protect a very tiny triangle uh, that is wild and is uh, uh, near Tiergarten. People were, had tents there and they stayed there for like three months and they had goats and so on. They had all kinds of things happening. It practically became like a new society for a short amount of time. And the many different stories of Tiergarten that sort of touched this kind of strange Strange, uh, strange moments. Uh, um, this is the um, uh, the, um, the zoo bunker. Uh, the zoo is also part of Tiergarten, even though it's not strictly part of Tiergarten, but it's just adjacent to it. And the zoo um, 
I mean, they, they took away an uh, hippopotamus ha house uh, and they built this uh, huge uh, structure. Uh, reinforced concrete, it was a plan by Spray, and uh, it was supposed to host uh, 20,000 people uh, during the air raids, and uh, it had also a uh, flak tower, so it had anti-aircraft um, weapons on top of it. It was also a, a military hospital, it was all kind of things inside. It was a, uh, also um, like a, um, a place where they would keep the gold and uh, also or artifacts from the Pergamon Museum. Anyway, so it's a really strange monster here and uh, also part of Tiergarten and uh, uh, what I'm showing it's a moment when it cracks and it took uh, a heavy load and many different uh, sessions of dynamite from the British army to destroy it or to crack it in half. For, for a long time, everything that was destroyed was everything around it. So many different structures from the zoo were destroyed before this got destroyed. And maybe we come to another flat tower, a uh, smaller one, the command tower, which is near the, the, the zoo bunker, a smaller one. And uh, this was, uh, uh, was more easily destroyed and it became uh, an island in the, um, the waterways within Tiergarten. And this island is a, is a hill, obviously, because of all the rubble. And the island became spontaneously uh, a bird sanctuary. So it's, it's kind of a beautiful place. And you can also only reach it through with, if you rent a boat and you can go on it. But otherwise, it just left to, to become wild. And it's uh, just for birds to be there. And by now, also, beavers are also residing in this place. Um, so it's a kind of interesting story near Tiergarten. Uh, this is um, Pariser Platz, uh, Pariser Plaza, so near uh, Brandenburger Tor. Tiergarten is here, right in the back. Um, Pariser Platz didn't exist um, uh, until this moment. This is 1996 when there was the MTV Euro Europe Award. <laughs> And they built this sort of uh, uh, hermetic tent uh, for VIP people. So 2,000 people were invited here. And uh, uh, Tom Jones would uh, moderate the, the, the thing. And uh, uh, I think take that, the group uh, won the first prize. <laughs> so that's, but in a way, it is a harbinger of what the, all the public spaces in, uh, in Berlin sort of became later on, uh, which are also, many of them are given away or rented out for uh, mass events. And uh, what's, what's beautiful, perhaps architecturally, it's just this kind of white uh, hermetic tent, and, and it, it's, a, it's the first time the plaza is defined because there aren't any buildings around it. And now, of course, it's fully built, it's very complete, and uh, it's completely static. But at this moment, this, this was the first definition. And in the backdrop, obviously, there was the Brandenburger Tour, which was a perfect set. And in the back, also, Tiergarten. <laughs> By the way, this reference is from Silva Linden, my, my, uh, my partner. This is really his own um, tra little treasure. <laughs> so, um, the big road that crosses uh, Tiergarten, not anymore the, the relief road, because that doesn't exist anymore, but this is um, uh, the, the street of um, 17 June, or Strasse des uh, um, 17 Juni. Uh, and this is, uh, it's been uh, already tradition since the 90s, with the first, first love parade, Christopher Street Day. There was the first moment when people started to occupy or take this road to, as, a, as a place of, of of celebration also, or, and then it's quite quickly became also a more commercial, uh, commercially used place with a fan mile. I don't know if you know about the soccer, the world championship 2006 was a big moment when it was rented out and then it became occupied by mass events for uh, many, many days. And so by now, uh, Tiergarten is a place of mass events for uh, 120 days, practically a year. So it's a one third of the year that is completely full and completely used. And um, just one. Yeah, Tiergarten is a, is a place of, of uh, 
perhaps lust and, and, and sensuality or, or, or a place also of the illicit or illicit use of the space of public space. Things can happen in Tiergarten that are tolerated in Tiergarten but not tolerated in the city. Um, this tends for, for that. <laughs> it's not a picture from Tiergarten, obviously, but it's a, it's a nice story. Um, it's a story of uh, one man in the 80s who donated uh, quite a large amount of money to, uh, uh, to build a, a shower near the gay cruising area, between the gay cruising area and the naturist, naturist area where people sunbathe naked. Uh, the people, the place where the people sunbathe naked is called uh, the flesh meadow, so the flesh visa. So because also it's in connection with the gay cruising area, so it's, it's all, uh, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's in, uh, very much in, uh, uh, intermingled. And um, so it's just about, uh, yeah, this possibility in, in this place of, of uses that are uh, actually in the city, yeah, are not tolerated, but uh, uh, the idea of uh, what is urban is actually can happen uh, in more in Tiergarten than in a city in itself. This is basically the idea. And this is a, um, uh, a social housing. It was built in the 80s, and it's in the proximity of Tiergarten, uh, therefore in proximity of the wall, so often uh, social housing were built in these areas, uh, in, especially in the 80s, yeah, I would say. Um, and we see uh, a wild um, animal, of course, an animal of prey. Uh, a habicht is called, uh, I forgot the name in, in English, but it's a hawk, sort of a large hawk. And, uh, and in, a bit, in a way, it represents also the, the presence of the wild animals in the city. Of course, Tiergarten is, draws all these animals, and that's why we have a strong presence uh, within the city and in a way it allows for the frontier of the human to recede so that the frontier of the natural can expand within the city or, or can overlap with the, uh, in, the, in the human environment. So that's a little bit of what it stands for. Also um, ambivalent decisions, especially after the reunification of reconstructing elements from the Baroque or elements that then didn't even exist within uh, Tiergarten. This is what happened also since 2009. And this is a sort of like the Venus uh, Basson. Um, and in a way, it is about this uh, force in Tiergarten to, to, to shape into a thing that is not, and that is not anymore, or that was never. And a little bit, this is tense for, a, it's always the, this fight with certain different kind of ideologies coming in. The chart, this is a regular chart from a botanist doing a survey in Tiergarten. In this case, it's a survey from 2000, 2006. Um, it's uh, um, Sophie Maria uh, Rona, and uh, she did a beautiful survey, especially of the east part of Tiergarten, because it's very, it was very rich of uh, rare plants. And, uh, and her her way of doing it is, is uh, suggesting, uh, so, uh, or at least what she what she did through her work was uh, the hope that uh, through a very uh, low um, maintenance of the, of the area, uh, through ways of forgetting certain areas or ways of uh, neglecting certain areas, this uh, lush flora could could flourish and could continue. And uh, unfortunately, later on, through this, the wave of reconstruction, this area was completely lost because, uh, um, this, uh, because of this, practically, what I showed you before. And the entire area was replanned and uh, also through artificial watering systems. So this is really the, the it's, it's really a loss because in, in this area, even though you see a chart, it was high grass growing and people also were sunbathing within the grass and just in front of Brandenburger Tor. So it's now a, a place of, that is uh, very representative and there is a Holocaust uh, monument and there is all kinds of monuments around it. So it became, it became so political that it, they couldn't stand the wilderness that was happening on the side of Tiergarten, even though it could coexist very well with this, uh, uh, in the, within this, uh, this setting. 
Okay, the pressure to Tiergarten, of course, there were areas of Tiergarten that got built. Uh, they were supposed to be a part of Tiergarten, but instead, after the reunification, were built, obviously, with a, a really luxury uh, villas or compounds and or ridiculous uh, projects uh, of uh, new, new, new classes. Uh, classic uh, style, unfortunately, where I'm, I, I'm showing it because of the ridiculousness of, of the road also. The road is supposed to be a road that you can drive with, with horses, you know, with a, but it's, it doesn't work because even though they have uh, garages within the, the housing, uh, this is very luxury housing with a uh, portier and all those kind of things, they still have to, uh, you know, they need to, to park in second row even. So that's uh, just so ridiculous. You just. It's uh, called diplomatic field, uh, the diplomatic uh, sort of uh, yeah uh, uh, quarter. It's um, a pavilion that is not in Tiergarten, but it stands for me a lot. Uh, for Tiergarten, it's a hunting lodge in uh, uh, the Peacock Island, the Fowen Insel, in uh, beautiful because it's also uh, it wasn't anymore a hunting lodge. It became like a place of observation of animals eventually because. Uh, the, the Peacock Island became uh, like a small zoo where of exotic animals. And uh, what's beautiful, it's really this sort of uh, psychedelic shape-shifting uh, surface that is done with the bark of, uh, of oak. And, uh, and in a way, it's, Tiergarten is very much like a shape-shifter entity. Um, perhaps one of the last of the, the episodes I was telling you, it's about picnic. This is a, a woman. This is her revere, in a way. It's the area that she uh, um, occupies every day when it's sunny. Um, it's a Chinese woman. She comes here and with her bike. There is a bike here. Yeah. And she stands there. And she, this is her place. And in a way, you know, in this lush forest. And uh, uh, it stands also for the idea of having a picnic or the freedom you have of interpretation of a place where you can stand, stay there, linger there as long as you want, and then you, you leave it, and uh, it's for somebody else to use. Um, I, I'm, I don't know. In this case, I always bring in the Strugatsky brothers' uh, um, roadside picnic, uh, especially the last part, uh, because there is a sentence that is, uh, that is enough for everybody, freedom for everybody, freedom of space for everybody. There is enough for everybody to live well and to enjoy life. So that's a bit the what it stands for. I want to finish with the um, four aspects. I hope it's, it's OK with the time. Four aspects of Tiergarten. I just, I just didn't want to mess it up. So I'm, I'm going to have my, about the, um, what I was telling you at the beginning, that Tiergarten, in a way, operates uh, outside the rules of the city, uh, outside normal codes. And uh, um, I, I, when I approached the research and then organized also a symposium, there were four categories that Tiergarten transgressed. So the heritage, the urbanism, ecology, and humanism. Um, so as a first the, about the heritage aspect, we know Tiergarten is uh, ancient. It's always been there. Uh, at the same time, it's brand new. So it's barely 70 years old. So, in a way, you can project all kinds of histories within it. You cannot just frame it within one moment in history, as, as often, uh, at least, I don't know. The heritage section in, in Berlin has this kind of, kind of strong ideas that we should frame it within one, one moment in history. It's a very old-fashioned way of thinking heritage, obviously. Uh, but in a way, Tiergandis really allows for projection from many different times simultaneously, which is kind of beautiful. And that's the way it transgresses also uh, the notion. Now, uh, I want to talk about ecology, even though this is a picture from the first gorilla that was brought in at the zoo. So it's a kind of it's a really uh, ambivalent form of ecology. But I'm not going to talk about the zoo. I'm going to talk about Tiergat. It stands it's Bobby, the gorilla. Uh, he also uh, he practically came as a small animal and grew up there and died there. Um, but in terms of ecology, why does Tiergarten transgress this, uh, the, the idea or the, the term of, of ecology? 
because it challenges the just a position of high biodiversity with intense hues and heritage at the same time. It's really beyond uh, any other park, like um, uh, Central Park and Hyde Park, Central Park in New York or Hyde Park in, in London cannot compare to the biodiversity in Tiergarten. But it also offers an account of the city where the human and the non-human and the social sphere are created together and they also are mutually dependent. And that's also the beauty of, of, of the framework of, of this place, also the spatial definition of this place. And transgressing uh, urbanism, uh, that's another thing. That's, uh, it's, it's kind of strange, also melancholic photograph here of the use of Tiergarten, spontaneous use of Tiergarten. What's beautiful about your garden, it's not divided into zones, it's not divided into functional areas. Um, it is a place of uh, contingency, so of inter free interpretation. It's far from being a terrain vague, so an undefined, undefined place. It's richly constructed because of the planned societies. So it's, in a way, it also endorses and, and, and supports the most uh, radical idea of what is urban life. Uh, what I was also telling you a little bit before, not only because it includes the gay cruising area or the, uh, the flash visa, the naturist meadow, or it accommodates the homeless uh, lady and the jogger and the nudist jogger and, and so on, all kind of SM activities happening in, in Tiergarten, but also because it has all these wild animals and all these wild plants, the falcon, the hawk, the night owl, the badger, the beaver, and uh, yeah, and the, the rare plants that are, can grow here. So in, uh, in terms of its, this vast transgression um, that is produced in Tiergarten is probably where true urban life is possible. And maybe this is a bit of the question. And the last section is about transgressing humanism and being like a post-human place. Because Tiergarten, because it's, it's so massive, and it's uh, so dense, and it has such an effect, impact on the city. It stands on its own rules. It's, uh, um, uh, the scale of its bio biomass really has a strong impact on the city. As an example, it draws cool, cool winds from the south, and it cools the city uh, by, its presence, by its presence. And it has also a level of autonomy that is really beyond uh, the human control. Still, even though there are many you know, things moving in towards it, but it's still kind of autonomous. So it's powerful. And, um, and it dissolves this antagonism between city and nature. And it is a model that conceives human and, and non-human organisms equally and mutually dependent. So, I repeat the question now, in terms of being Tiergarten a post-human model, when does a human constructed place go beyond the human and how necessary is this transgression? And with this, I finish <laughs> the talk. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.